What then can we say in defence of God's commands and the Israelites' actions? We would like to make ten brief points. Firstly, the Canaanites were some of the most wicked people that ever lived. Over recent years, historians and archaeologists have uncovered numerous clues and artefacts which clearly portray the moral, social and spiritual depths which the Canaanites had sunk to. They were indescribably and almost unimaginably depraved. By some reckonings, they were probably about the third most wicked race that ever lived, after Noah's generation and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And as such, far from being innocent victims of an unjust and cruel foreign policy, they were a moral cancer, endangering the whole human race. The kindest thing that God could do for humanity then was to cut out every root and fibre of these wicked people whose lifestyle invited widespread international divine judgment. And do we not see here a picture of gospel grace to evil and wicked men and women everywhere? God has announced the sentence of judgment on the whole human race. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. However, in the gospel, terms of mercy and peace are whispered to those who have ears to hear. Have you taken this opportunity to surrender? The honour of God's attributes was at stake. One of the results of the Canaanite lifestyle, or should we say death style, was that God's character was being impugned. People were looking at what the Canaanites were doing without any apparent consequence to them and concluding, God cannot be holy if he does not act against such behaviour. Or they would say, if he is holy, he cannot be powerful, else we would see evident divine action. So God's character was at stake, and so the Canaanite conquest helped restore the luster of God's attributes. After it, onlookers would surely conclude, well, obviously, God is holy and God is powerful. But it may be said, does not the killing of women and children put a stain in God's attributes? Well, Israel's history reveals that it was often the heathen women who were a greater danger than the men. All the powers of Balaam and Balak could not touch Israel in Numbers 22 to 24. But in the very next chapter, we read of the success of the Moabite woman in making Israel sin. Numbers 25, 1 to 5. See also Numbers 31, 15 to 16. The virtue of woman is often one of the main restraints on immorality in society. But when this is removed, women become more dangerous than men. As we can see all around us today, the degeneration of society accelerates. What about the children, though? Was it really necessary for them to die? Well, it's been shown that even very young children following the, the habits and morals of their parents, even if removed from them at a very early age. Even today in parts of the Arab world, we can see the powerful effect of anti-Israel indoctrination at an early age. Any one of these Canaanite children could have grown into a pharaoh or a Nebuchadnezzar. God is the potter and we are the clay. We must therefore be willing to be used and shaped by him to show forth his attributes. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Of the same lump to make one vessel unto honour and another to dishonour? Romans 9. God's honour is more important than ours. 
God's character is more important than our or anybody's comfort. An idea of the final judgment is vividly set before us all in the Canaanite conquest. God's spoken of in scripture as a man of war, Exodus 15.3, and the Lord of hosts or of armies. And this war imagery is continued on into the New Testament when it speaks of the events leading up to and including the final judgment. 2 Thessalonians 2, 5-10, Revelation 16, 16. In other words, the Canaanite conquest is a foreshadowing of Christ's conquest. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture, and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 19, 11-16. Are you ready for this final battle? Which side will you be on? Will you be with the conqueror or the conquered?